song declares, let freedom fill the room. And when that part comes up, I want to hear you shout it out real loud. Are you ready? We will lift our eyes 
we won't fear the fight there is one who's stronger heart pressed on each side we will not lose sight of the one who's greater one name one name holds every victory one voice that silences
that's who you are angels and her sing a song for your honor this power belongs to you power belongs to you no i could never grow tired telling you you're worthy there's so many ways i sing love your glory no i will never grow tired of telling you you're worthy over and over again always now and forever you're matchless fold in the color time at Bonita Valley, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the service. If you want some info on BVCC, simply complete our online connect card. Here's how it works. Scan the QR code you'll find in the seat pocket in front of you with the camera on your smartphone. Open the link that will take you to connect card. You'll find a number of connecting options, including first-time guests, 
prayer requests, I want some info on a Bonita Valley ministry. Check the appropriate connection box you're after. Push submit and we'll get back to you ASAP. If you're a first time guest today, please stop by Guest Central at the end of the service and pick up a special gift bag we have just for you. We'd like to take a few moments to tell you about some things coming up for you and your family at Bonita Valley. Are you exhausted as a parent? Are you tired of your kids bossing you around? Yeah. Then you need to come to the Parents Rising Conference. Who's speaking? Dr. Derry Chapman, author of the five love languages, Arlene Pelican, Bill and Pam Farrell, and Sally Burke. The Parents Rising Conference happens this Saturday, March 2nd. To register for this event, go to happyhomeuniversity.com or stop by the Parents Rising table in the courtyard before you leave today. Growing up is always about choices and practices. Our 201 base class, Moving Toward Maturity, is a seminar for those who want to spiritually grow. Pastor Jordan will be sharing four essential habits we need to grow and develop as a believer. This class happens on Sunday, March 3rd, from 5 to 7.30 p.m. in the Life Center. For all who've completed our 101 membership seminar, this is your next step toward a great life that God has for you. A casual meal and childcare will be provided. Sign up online at bonitavalley.com slash base class or stop by the base class table in the courtyard before you leave today. Bonita Valley's Faith and Fitness Ministry wants to invite you to a new fitness opportunity on Friday nights called CrossBox. CrossBox mixes boxing techniques with cardio for a great workout that will improve your stamina, relieve stress, and help develop muscular endurance all while burning calories. Men, women, and youth ages 14 and up are welcome. A donation of $5 is suggested. This limited time class will happen every Friday from February 16th to March 22nd from 6 to 7 p.m. in the Life Center Gym. We believe God has entrusted us to be managers of our time, talent, and treasures. We believe He wants us to use temporary resources to make a real and eternal difference in our world. And that's what giving at BVCC is all about. When we give to God, we see lives change and transform, both others and ours. There are three ways to give at BVCC. Online at bonitavalley.com slash giving, by texting Bonita Valley to 833-303-9325, or by mailing your offering to BVCC, 4744 Bonita Road, Bonita, California, 91902. During our Sunday services, we offer a professionally staffed nursery that will lovingly care for your little one up to two years of age. We also offer an outdoor patio area and a family room with TV monitors for parents who choose to keep children under two years of age with them. Pastor Davida and her team lead incredibly fun ministries for preschool and elementary aged children in the Life Center Gym. Bonita Valley Youth also hosts classes at 9 and 11 a.m. for students in middle and high school in the Fireside Room. During today's service, you can take notes, sign up for events, and even give using your smartphone. Simply use the Follow the Service QR code located in the seat pocket in front of you. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. This weekend, I want to finish a little two-part mini-series we started last weekend. The series is simply titled, A Great Love Story, Ruth's and Ours. Now, if you were here last weekend, this, this little mini-series comes from the Old Testament book of Ruth. It's only four chapters, very short little book, but it's an amazing, amazing story. Now, again, if you were here last time, if... if the book of Ruth was a movie, it would be a chick flick. 
uh, a rom-com, a romantic comedy, because I don't know if chick flicks politically correct, and I don't really care. But it, it's, it's kind of this love story thing. Now, I know that, that, that romantic love stories is not the movie genre for everyone. Like, I'm more of a Top Gun, Mission Impossible, but, but, but it, it's, it's, it's not whether you like romantic movies, whether you love romantic movies, every one of us needs a love story of our own. And the, the book of Ruth and the love story of Ruth not only tells us, it shows us how. It's a, it's a show and tell story. Now again, I don't know how you learn, and there's different learning styles, and, 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 and I'm a visual learner. I like to see things, I write things down. When I remember names, I write them down. Uh, my message, I write down, I have colors, because I have to kind of see things. So for me, I learn better, not just by explanation, by explanation and example. Okay, come on, how many of you, when you put something together, you read the directions? Well, I, I, don't, I don't read Chinese, but, but, um, but you watch it. Do any of you do what? download how-to videos? I go to how-to videos all the time. If you haven't, you're missing it. So, so just this week, I was having a computer issue, which is kind of a weekly deal for me, and I'm, I'm kind of have a problem with Word and the thing I'm trying to do, and it's protected something, and how do I unprotect it? And so I go to Google, and I go, how do I get this unprotected? And there's a video. Now, there's a, there's, you can read about it, and I'm like, I'm more confused than I, so, but I watched it. And when I watch it, they show me what to do, bring up this, bring up that. I kept stopping it. I did it. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> You're easily impressed. Well, I, so, I, so I did it. I did, I, I did it for myself. Because normally, I'm, I'm, I'm honest, I'll call our IT guy and I'll say, what do I do? He goes, turn it off and on. <laughs> yeah, I can use a hammer too, all right? So, 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 so yeah, so you turn it off and on, you reset. I, I get that. But it's so, I, I do this at my house. I can't tell you how many times now. I mean, like, once I got Google, I got smart. So I'll, I'll, I'll play these videos and I'll learn how to do. That's really what the story of Ruth is all about. Because it's not just her story, it's our story. In fact, all the biblical stories are not just about them. They're about them, but they're for us. And they show us things. The Bible says, I'm going to show you in story form what to do. I'm going to show you in story form what not to do. Because we often learn best by examples, by seeing things. And that's really what we get in the story of Ruth. It's such an incredible four-chapter love story that's not just hers, it's ours. And two of the great themes, and, and there's so much in the book of Ruth that we could walk through, and we'll come back to it. There's no doubt about it because it's just been, been ministering to me on so many levels but there are two main themes that have been breaking up for this two-part series as we're finishing up the love month of February. Um, the first is how, how greatly God loves us. And we see that in the story of Ruth. And we walked through that last week, and I'll not repeat all that. It's online. But the gist of how God greatly loved Ruth was he loved her, he chose her, he adopted her. We talked about the fact that she's in the family tree of Jesus. A Moabite is an enemy of God's people, an outsider, a woman, a widow. I mean, man, you put every strike you could have, she had, but she was loved by God. She was chosen by God. Before she chose to love God, God chose to love her, and then he adopted her into his family. And she literally became the, the great grandmother of Jesus. David, King David, the greatest Old Testament king Israel ever had, she was in. Not only is that true of her, it's true of us. Because Paul says in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, that you are loved, you are chosen, you are adopted by God. So the way God loved her, he's showing that's how he loves us. How do you love me? Like God loved Ruth. He loves you, he loves me. So that's the first the first great love theme. Here's the second. In the book of Ruth, it shows us how to greatly love others. And specifically, it shows us how to find and keep the love of our life. I don't know if you're interested, but you should be. How do you find, how do you keep the love of your life? Now, Ruth loved Naomi, her, her mother-in-law, 
There's an incredibly deep friendship love there. And so we learn about that. But it really dials in on the specific of, of romantic love, of, of the love of our life, of the soulmate of our life. Now listen, this message, listen very, very carefully. Come here, you go, man, I came to the wrong week. No, you came to the right weekend. Because this message is for singles. It's for marriage. You're like, I'm already married. No, it's still for you because it's also finding and keeping. Because finding's not the, the last step. Keeping, growing. It's for singles again. Like you were single, you're not single, you're single again. Maybe divorce, maybe death, maybe who knows. It's for want to get married again. It's for I'm never getting married again. How many know this is for everybody? Because this, this message is about how we love greatly in friendships, which all of us need, soul-enriching, soul-shaping friendships, and how we love greatly in loving relationships with a spouse. And so it, it literally is for every single one of us. And there are principles that we're going to walk through just for a couple moments that apply to every significant relationship of your life, but especially, especially finding and keeping the love of our life. And so that's where we're going for the next few moments. And, and, and it all involves choices. There were four loving choices that were made in this story that are critical in this story, and they're critical in your story and mine. Did a whole series on choices a few weeks back? We're back to choices, because choices we make make us or break us. So let's get started. Here's the first one. In your notes, if you're following along, on the phones, online, here's the first. Loving choice number one for finding and keeping the love of your life. Get relationally healthy. If you want to find and keep the love of your life, get healthy relationally. Ruth did. She got healthy relationally first by getting right with God. She got, she got spiritually healthy. We talked about that the last time. That she personally believed and trusted in God. She's in God's family not just because she married in, but because she believed in. She believed in God, was placed in God's family. We looked at it, Luke, Ruth chapter 1, verse 16. When Naomi, her mother-in-law, is going back to Bethlehem because this is a story of three funerals and a wedding and a baby. And so, so, so their husbands die. Naomi's husband died. Elimelech, her two sons died. She now has two widowed daughter-in-laws, and she's widowed three widows. They have no way of supporting themselves, no way of money. And, and, and Naomi says, I'm going back to Bethlehem, I'm going home. And, and the daughter said, we'll go with you. She goes, no, you, you stay here. You're Moabite. This is your land. This is your people, your family. Go back to your moms. Your moms can hopefully help you find another husband. I can't. Oprah goes back. Ruth says, I'm with you. I'll go with you. I'll die with you. I'll not come back to this place. I am with you. She wasn't just with Naomi. Watch this. Ruth 1 verse 16 your people will be my people, and your God will be what? My God. May the Lord, she uses a different word here for God, because there's different words for God. Our, our worship team talked about Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides for us. There's all kinds of words, and the, the words, the titles of God describe for us who God is, aspects of who God wants to be in our life. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace. She calls him Lord, Adonai, the, the, the Lord, the leader, the, the, the director of my life, because the God who believed in her, she believed in. See, if you want to be right in your relationships, it starts with being right with God, because until I'm right with God, nothing else is right. Until I'm healthy with God, nothing else is healthy in my life. Jesus said, seek first God's kingdom. That's his rule, his rightness in your life. The righteousness of God means standing right. Seek health in God, and then everything else in your life will be right. That's where it starts. If I don't get him right, nothing else is right. So that's where it's, so I want a great relationship. It starts with you getting healthy, with me getting healthy, and getting healthy with God. Her health shows in getting right with God. Her health also shows she got healthy in how she loved her mother-in-law. And it's an amazing story of love. Now, I don't have time, because I can't turn this one message into a series. 
But come on, let, be real with me, with me for a moment. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this. And I probably shouldn't even ask this, but I'm going to. Come on, how many of you daughter-in-laws want us? Want to go wherever your mother-in-law goes, stay wherever she stays, sleep where she sleeps, eat where she eats. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so yeah, it's an amazing story. And now I love her, you know, for a while. <laughs> a limited while. Because nobody can treat my son like you. So, yeah, yeah, I get that. Her love for her mother-in-law, it's unreal. Why? Because it was God's love. See, see, her love for her mother-in-law was other-centered. It's no longer about her. Real God love is other. God so loved that he gave. Real love always is other-centered. It's not self-centered. It's other-centered. So I'm going where you're going. I'm going to die where you die. I'm never coming back. I'm burning this boat because I'm, I'm with you. Does it remind you of anybody? Like spiritual father, like spiritual daughter. The God who loves us that way loves through us that way. And we know that she's growing in, in health, in relational health, because of her, of her being right with God and because of what she does with her, her mother-in-law. Now, here's one of the reasons why it's so important to get relationally healthy if you want to find and keep the love of your life and listen very, very carefully. This is so, so foundational. Healthy people are attracted to healthy people. You've heard the phrase, birds of a feather flock together. So do people. It's amazing how the same type of people find the same type of people. How often we connect on the level of our own health. And so if you want to connect on a healthy level, get healthy, and you'll be attractive to healthy people. Now let me give you the flip side. And I have counseled hundreds of people. And I've heard questions, and I'll paraphrase the question, why do I keep dating these losers? Why did I marry this not winner? I don't always want to say it because I don't like to hurt people's feelings or my own. But we tend to connect on the level of our health. And if I'm always connecting in deep ways with deeply defective, flawed, hurting, wounded people, maybe because I'm trying to fix something in me. Dr. Henry Cloud, great Christian psychologist, author, writes, listen, work on the issues that are in your soul. Whatever those issues are, past childhood hurts, recurring themes, patterns in your relationships and work life, other areas of brokenness, pain, and dysfunction, as you grow spiritually, you're going to be naturally closer to others and get a fuller life. The whole life is a full life. And the byproduct of fullness is that the fulfilled person is also, listen, a very attractive one. The more full and whole and healthy you become, the more attracting you become to full, healthy, whole people. Now, I am not saying you and I should ever write off someone who isn't spiritually or relationally healthy. We're never to write anybody off. We're to help them become healthy and whole spiritually in every way, in every way that we can. But listen to me very, very carefully. We are to help people that are not spiritually, relationally whole, but we are not to make them our inner circle, our closest, dearest, soul-shaping friend or spouse. You go, that's kind of tough. Jesus didn't. John chapter 2, there's a powerful little phrase. That Jesus was doing all kinds of things and miracles, and people said, man, I'm in. I'm with you. But it says he would not entrust himself to them because he knew everyone's heart. He only entrusted himself first to his, 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 his 12, his inner circle, to three, to one. Why? Because you are to love everyone, but I don't entrust myself to everyone. The people that are closest to me, the closest influencers of my, be, the Bible says be very, very careful about the closest friends in your life. 
because you're the average of the five people you hang out with the most. And so you want to choose very carefully who's the closest in your life because of the incredible power they have to influence you and you them. To find and keep the love of our life, we need to ask ourselves this question, how relationally healthy am I? How do we know? Look at your relationships. How long do they last? How deep are they? Look at the patterns in your life. How am I with God? Upward, outward. And here's the second question. How can I become healthier in every significant area of my life? How can I prioritize health spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially, relationally? And I want to make you a promise at Bonita Valley, and if you were here and saw the video announcements, we are committed to having healthy opportunities. We really are. Our small groups are healthy opportunities to connect with God, to connect with others. Our children's ministries, our, our student ministries, our men's, our women's, our, our small groups, our recovery ministries, celebrate recovery. I spend, honestly, every week I peek out at every ministry and I'm just blown away and I'm thanking God for so many who just getting all the, oh, half of our church is involved in smaller groups in which they're, 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 they're growing opportunities and getting healthy opportunities and there are sports and there's physical stuff. We just started this boxing thing. I peeked in on that on Friday again. Now my only concern is, and it's growing, my only concern is it was all women and two guys, but it's, it's like... So, 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 guys, it's, it's, first of all, if you're looking, for, they're there, but, but it's, it's, and if you're a husband of one of those wives, you might want to come keep up. So I'm just saying, it's, it's, that happens on Fridays, and, and there's, there's marriage groups, and Parents Rising is coming up next Saturday. What's that all about? Arlene Pellicane's put together this, this one-day conference, and Gary Chapman, and the Farrells, who are great writers and speakers, and it is one day to become as healthy as you can be as a parent, as a person, in marriage, as a grandparent. These aren't just things to do. These are things that will make you healthy. And the healthier you become, the healthier your relationships become. You and I have got to, if you want to have the biggest, best love of your life, friend of your life, commit yourself to becoming as healthy as you can be. Here's the second choice. Loving choice number two, pay relational attention. Pay relational attention. It's exactly what Ruth and Boaz do. Now, actually, Boaz sees Ruth before Ruth sees Boaz. Ruth goes to harvest in a field. We'll talk about that in a moment. She has no idea whose field it is. It's Boaz's field. Boaz comes to check on his field, his harvesters. It's harvest time, and he spots Ruth. He pays attention to Ruth before Ruth pays attention to him. We read about it. Ruth 2, verse 5. Boaz shows up. Boaz asks his foreman, who is that young woman over there? Who does she belong to? The foreman replied, she is the young woman from Moab who came back with Naomi. She asked this morning, she asked me if she could gather grain behind the harvesters. She's been hard at work ever since except for a few minute, minutes rest in the shelter. Now, again, let me just give you a backstory real fast because we're like, what, what's this all about? We're like, we're not harvest. People would live in a little town, but all the fields were outside of town, and you would go out to the field. They were owned by different people. You never knew exactly. Like, they knew whose field was whose field, and they had rocks that would block it off. But if you're a stranger, you don't know who owns what. <laughs> There's a little phrase repeated in this story so many times, and I'll just give it, we'll come back to it. As it happened... Or it so happened, of all the fields, whose field does she show up in? Boaz. As it happened, she didn't, there was no sign, welcome to the field of Boaz. So she shows up. Now, what's she doing? She's doing something that that, that was done, especially in, in older times and still today in some parts of the world. And the poor are allowed to go after the harvesters and follow them and pick up any leftovers or things that are there. In fact, it was not only a practice that people did, it was a practice God commanded. I don't have time to unpack all of this story because it's just, there's just so many details, but it's Deuteronomy 24, and Moses is preparing the children of Israel because they've been slaves and they haven't had their own land, and now they're going to have their own land, and they're going to have their own farms, and they're going to have their own produce, and Moses said this, when you get to that land, and when you're harvesting your amazing harvest, I want you to be a compassionate, sloppy harvester. 
What are you talking about? He says, I don't want you to, don't harvest it all. I want you to leave some. Leave some of the grain, leave some of the grapes, leave some of the olives. Don't, don't pick everything clean. Why? And he specifically says, leave some for the foreigner. Leave some for the poor. Leave some for the widow. It was, it was God's way of, of, of commanding that there, there'd be a care and a way. They didn't have social security. They didn't have these government programs. No, God says, you, you let them follow. No, you don't just give them a handout. They work, but they follow you. And you make sure you leave some. It was not only command. It's, this is so incredible. It wasn't only command. God says, I'm going to tell you something. If you'll leave some for them, I'll make more for you. He said, I will bless you and bless your harvest if you'll bless those who come along at, in your harvest and you leave some for. That's, that's this picture. And, and Ruth has asked Naomi, can I go do this? And she said, sure, because Naomi was too old to do it. Boaz finds out who Ruth is, all she has done. He gets her backstory. How she left everything to come with Naomi and how she's taking care of her and how she's just been an amazing, not just daughter-in-law, an amazing friend. So he wants to talk to her. So he goes over and, and he greets her in, in a very kind way. And, and then he tells her, listen, I don't want you going to any other field. You come back to my field and only my field. Don't go anywhere else. I will make sure you are protected. Because she was incredibly vulnerable. I'll make sure you're protected. Nobody bothers you. No one hassles you. No guys hassle you. I'll make sure you have water because it's, it's hot. It's difficult work. I have a well. When my workers drink, you drink. You're in on it. You're with us. When we take a lunch break, you're invited. You can eat with us, drink water with us. Don't go anywhere else. Until harvest is over, you come right back here. But he doesn't stop with that. He prays for her. He literally says, and may God bless you for all that you... See, when he first showed up, she sees him, and he blesses his workers. She notices that. Then he sees her and talks to her, and he blesses her. She notices that. Boaz not only paid attention to Ruth, Ruth was paying attention to Boaz. How do I know that? Because she went back and told her mother-in-law everything. That's women. <laughs> they tell him everything. Now, listen very carefully, because some of you at this point are going, so what? Here's what. People are always telling us who they are if we're paying relational attention. Everyone in your life is always telling you who they are if you pay attention. Their words reveal their hearts. The Bible says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Let me hang around you for a few hours or days or weeks, and I'll tell you what you're full of. Because you say it. No, you say it. You talk about it, what you're full of. If it's cars or houses or things or sports or games or, or, or God or... Listen carefully what somebody talks about. If they never talk about God, there's a chance they're not full of God. Oof. If you don't hear about that somewhere early on, that's not maybe the thing that's just, the disciples said, we can't help but speak of what we have seen and heard. Why? Because we're full of that. We're just full of it. We can't help but, but God is in our life. So listen to them. So words reveal our hearts, actions reveal our character. It takes time to spot a character. And I don't mean a real character, I mean the character that we have. And everybody has a character. Now some people, you see them coming, Come on, how many of you are like, this person is just not? And others, you don't see them coming. You think they are the best thing since sliced bread. And then you find out they're not. There's a story that follows them. That takes some time. So character is harder to determine, but it's determinable, determinable by actions. We need to pay careful attention to words and actions, to heart and character. Now, just a real quick side note, and I can't do all these side notes or we won't get finished, but when Boaz paid attention to Ruth, he got her backstory. He heard about what she did with Naomi and how she came and she was a Moabite, strange land, how she loved God. He was just, he was blown away because th there's a story behind this person. There's a story behind every person. And there was a story behind Boaz. At first, Ruth 
just saw him, then she listened to him, she saw him pray, she saw him be kind to others. But there's a reason why he acted the way he acted, and he was kind the way he was kind. And the reason he, and, and she, she bowed down to the ground, she goes, why would you treat me this way? She says, literally, I'm a foreigner. Why would you do this? I'll tell you one of the reasons. His backstory is found in the same genealogy we looked at last week, Matthew 1. Matthew 1 the genealogy of Jesus. Watch this, Matthew 1, verse 5. On the screens, here's Boaz's backstory. Salmon was the father of who? Boaz, that's the guy we're talking about. Whose mother was who? Rahab. Time out. Anybody remember Rahab? Now some of you go like, I'm not really into the Bible. I'm not, all these names are strange to me. Let me tell you just real fast. Rahab was a prostitute in Jericho. She ran a brothel on the wall. She had her own house right on the wall. And they would have in and, and prostitute, and that's who she was. But she had heard, all of Jericho had heard that the Israelites were coming. And they had heard what God had done, how he parted the Red Sea, and what happened to the Egyptians. Man, news travels. She didn't just hear it. She didn't have a lot of light, but she believed in the light she had. And Scripture says she put her faith in God. What, whatever... She put whatever trust she had in the God, whatever she knew of God. And when the spies came and they're checking it out, she hid them. Because they were all on high alert for spies. And so she hid them. Then she let them out over the wall. They escaped. She told them what to do. And, 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 and then she made them promise, when you come back and, and you defeat this town. Because she believed that God was in this. Spare me. They said, hang this cord outside your window, the scarlet cord, and if that cord is there, who's ever in this room, when we come back, we will spare them. That's Rahab's story. So Rahab, a prostitute who was a foreigner who believed in God, was spared by God, not just spared by God, but included in God, made a part of God's family. She's in Jesus' family tree. <laughs> oh, come on. Like, you're like, this is amazing. But what's amazing is she goes to the field of a man whose mother or maybe grandmother, because the, the generations weren't always exact, had been a foreigner and a prostitute and an outsider who became an insider. Do you know why Boaz had a heart for a woman who was an outsider? Because his mom was. Because his grandmother was. <laughs> it just so happened that God sends her to the field of a man who had the same experience and had a heart that others did not have. God uses every experience in your life to shape you, to make you. That's the backstory of the story of grace in everybody's life. So Boaz responds to her in this loving way. We not only need to pick careful relational attention, but please, please stay with me. We need to pay attention over an extended amount of time. They paid attention to each other. They, come, they talked. They connected over weeks throughout the entire harvest season. Now, I'm sure everyone in this place, if you haven't, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, love at first sight. Anybody heard of love at first sight? There's no such thing. I mean it. There is no such thing. So you know, don't argue with me. I'm right. <laughs> There's interest at first sight, no doubt. There's infatuation at first sight, whoa, no doubt. There's hope at first sight, no doubt. Oh, I hope, I hope, I hope. There's lust at first sight. But real love always takes time. It's never instant. Can't be. Because real love isn't something you feel. It's an attitude and an action. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, Paul writes, Love is patient, kind, not jealous or boastful, not rude, does not demand its own way, it's not irritable, keeps no record of being wronged, doesn't rejoice about injustice, rejoices when truth wins out, never gives up, never loses faith, always hopeful, endures through every circumstance. Let me tell you something about 
1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, love is a verb. It's not a feeling. Now, it involves feelings. Thank God. I'm glad. I'm glad you have a quiver in your liver. That's a good thing. Your heart goes faster. Yeah, those are all good things. God gave us emotions as well. The emotion of love is terrific. But love is more than a feeling. Love is an action. See, I don't fall out of love. I choose to stop loving. Mm. <laughs> You're not going to like by the time I'm done. But I'm just saying. We fell out of love. No, you chose to love and you don't fall into something. You don't fall out of it. You choose in, you choose out. You do. And so love is a choice. Now, now I, I know someone after this service, I'll guarantee because it happens. Some, after this service, someone's going to come up to me and say, oh, yeah, I know Jeff, but, but I know somebody. They, they dated a week. They got married and they've been married 50 years. Love at first sight works. <laughs> okay. Yes, that, I, I actually know a couple that happened to them as well. That happens. But let me give you a word picture. How many know that it is possible to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel and survive? <laughs> People have done it. It's not the best way to see Niagara Falls. Okay. Because one person went over a fall in a barrel and lived to tell the story doesn't mean everybody should have that same story. <laughs> Some of you are with me. Yeah, there are exceptions. People, people make decisions super fast and it works out. But Dr. Neil Clark Warren, the Christian clinical psychologist, co-founder of eHarmony, has written a great book. And in the notes page, on the online page, notes page, I gave you the title. Here's his book, the title of the book, and he's got several, but this one really ties in what we're talking about. The title is Falling in Love for All the Right Reasons, How to Find Your Soulmate. He's amazing. The insights are amazing. If I could crystallize his advice into one little statement, taking more time is always better than taking less. More time will not hurt you in finding the love of your life, less time will. Because you just can't really know somebody too fast, at least to know them in their character, who they are. So Boaz and Ruth paid attention to each other over a long amount of time. That's a lesson that's showing us. So loving choice number one, get relationally healthy. Loving choice number two, pay relational attention. Loving choice number three, take relational action. Take relational action. This story, and I'm going to unpack it really quickly for you, but this story is full of, of people taking loving action, including God. God is the first one who takes action in this story. I told you last week, Ruth is, is an unusual book in that you'll read of no miracles. You, you don't read of people being healed. You don't read of any. And, and it's like you don't even see God like, like, but you see God's fingerprints everywhere. And God is in this story. Where's God in this story? When it says, and it so happened, do you know who make it, made it so happen happen? God is all over this story. That Elimelech and Naomi go to, to, to Moab, and then later David goes to Moab, and then they come back, and, 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 and Ruth comes back, and Ruth believes in God, and then, and then she happens to go to Boaz Field, and he happens to be a relative, and he happens to be the, the kinsman redeemer. We'll talk about it. All these things. How many of you know that the steps of a righteous person are God-ordered? Now, let me give you another one. I mean, God even orders steps of non-believers. How many of you look back at your life and go, I didn't even believe in God, but he was working in my life. He was working in my steps. God's in the story. Jesus, uh, Jesus says, my father is always working. He's always at work in your heart and mind, your life and mind. So, so God takes loving actions. Then Naomi takes loving actions. She takes relational action. Ruth chapter 3 verse 2, she's seeing all the stuff happening with, with, with Boaz and with, with Ruth. And she says, quote, it's time to make our move. 
That's a mother-in-law. Like this time, it's time to fish or cut bait. It's time to do something here. What does she do? Here's what she tells Ruth to do. Ruth 3, verse 3. Take a bath. Put on some perfume. Get all dressed up. Go to the threshing floor. Don't let Boaz know you're there until the party's well underway. He's had plenty of food and drink. When you see him slipping off to sleep, watch. Watch where he lies down and then go there. Lie at his feet. Watch this. To let him know you are available. You're available to him for marriage. Then wait. See what he says. He'll tell you what to do. Take action. Ruth does it. That's when she takes relational action. Her mother-in-law says, listen, I, I know how this works. Here's what you got to do. I, I don't have time to share all. I, I research so much stuff for this message, and I can't share all of it with you. But they ask these elementary kids about love, and how do you know you're in love, and how do you fall in love? And, and one girl says, I don't really know, but I think it has to do with how you smell. <laughs> That's why they sell so much deodorant and perfume. You're right. He's only seen you in your work clothes. Put on your good stuff. He's only smelled you, your work smell. Let him smell perfume. Let him, let, let him see what you look cl- like all cleaned up. Now, I believe that Ruth's actions are descriptive and not prescriptive. Okay. In other words, I've not told my daughter to do this. Okay. Like this is what she did. She was taking action, but not every person should go sleep at some place. So, so, Boaz wakes up middle of the night. Somebody's at his feet. Who's at my feet, he asks. Ruth identifies herself. It's me, it's Ruth, your servant. Then she says, spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. And we're all like, what? Translation, marry me. So she was saying, you have the legal right, you own the land, you're connected to our family, I'm single. She got rid of her grieving garment, she put on a great dress, she smelled great. Marry me. That's pretty much how Jewel and I got married. Jewel said, <laughs> my wife said, marry me. I said, okay. That's my story, I'm sticking. No, I, I'm not sticking to it, because you'll tell her I said that, and I will no longer have a great growing marriage. So I'm going to tell you the truth. No, 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 no. I I took action, and I took action first. And I've shared some of this, so I just want to give you the super fast version. My senior year, I'm recording an album. The lady that was my producer, an amazing lady, and I'd done some recording with her. Jewel had in a different, I never met Jewel I had taken voice lessons from Jewel's brother. I knew her brother. I knew her sister and brother-in-law, but I'd never met Jewel. I heard of her, but I didn't know her. She didn't know me. We kind of had heard of each other, but that was it. We had no ways for our paths to cross. We did not go to the same colleges. We weren't in the same circles. And this producer of mine said, are you seeing anybody seriously? I said, no, no. And she said, well, you should think about that Jewel. And Jewel Mitchell, and that that was her name. And and I'm like, yeah, I I know her, but... I don't know her. And, and she handed me a quarter and said, call her and gave me your phone number. And I go, what's that all about? <laughs> Some of you, remember when you didn't have cell phones? <laughs> you had to have a quarter. <laughs> or make an emergency call. I don't know however you did it. So, so she gives me a quarter and a number, and, and I didn't call. Because I couldn't think, of, how do I start this conversation? I was given a quarter to call you. Like, how, how do I start this conversation? <laughs> you don't know me. Click. So I was like, I'm not, I'm not doing this. You got to have a starting line. I didn't have a starting line. And so anyway, so, so, so nothing happened for a few more weeks. And now I'm just like a few weeks away from leaving college and graduating, hitting the road full time. And I'm at the airport and Jewel was working at the airport. I knew, I knew she worked at the airport and in the rental car place. And so I'm there dropping somebody off. And, and, and as I walk back, I, I, I see this guy. That's got to be her. She's blonde. I see her. She's at, the, she's at the Hertz counter. I know that's where she's supposed to be. But I don't go to that counter because it can't be that obvious, right? <laughs> the next counter was a girl I knew from school. And so I went to her counter. And then I talked over to the other. So, so I just, you got to take some action, right? And so then I moved over to her. So, so, so I'm talking. I didn't call her the next day. I called her the day after that because you take action, but you got to. So, and then from there, I took the next action. The only reason we're married is because I took action. 
seriously. Now, I know some of you, you're, you're like super spiritual. If God wants me to be married, he'll send them to my house. <laughs> At least that works, right? If you want a UPS driver, FedEx driver, Amazon Prime driver, or Jehovah Witness. Okay, if you want one of those, <laughs> sorry. They're the ones who ring your doorbell, right? That's it. Like <laughs> that's. I'm not, hey, and if you drive for any of those, hey, God bless you. You could be a winner. <laughs> not sure about the Jehovah Witness thing, but no. No, no, you, you got to take action. So God takes loving action. Naomi takes loving action. Ruth takes loving action. Now Boaz takes loving action. Boaz says yes to Ruth's proposal. But he wasn't the first in line to marry her. Because they had this kind of deal, and, and the kinsman redeemer was the next closest to that family member, to Elimelech and Naomi. And so, so he says yes, but, but he doesn't, he can't do it right away. And so Ruth's like, is he going to act? And, and Naomi goes, yeah, just wait. He will not let this rest. He's not first in line, but he will be. So Boaz goes to the town. He goes to the city gates, and that's where they would do business. All the business guys hung out there. It's when you bought, sold things, because you did it in front of others, and your contract was verbal, and it was visual. And sometimes when you made a contract, someone you would take your shoe off, your sandal off, and you'd hand the sandal, what's that all about? I'm not going to walk on that anymore. It's no longer mine. It's yours. I don't walk on it. I don't tread there. It's yours. So Boaz goes to this, this town gate, to the city gate, and he waits for the first guy in line, which is not him. Doesn't say he asked him, doesn't say he called him, doesn't say he needed to talk to you. No, he just, he just waited because all the business guys showed up and he happens to show up. Now, this part is funny. Most of us don't read Hebrew, but this is really funny. There's funny parts in this story. There really are. And, and here's one of the funny parts. The writer of this story, and the story is so well crafted. I mean, I won't give you all the details. It's just so incredibly well crafted as a story. The writer of this story gives us names. We've read them. But this first in line relative, here's the literal translation that the writer gives this guy. He calls him Mr. So and so. Doesn't call his name. Even this kind of tough word, it means so and so, it means it's very possible he's implying he was no big deal. Or compared to Boaz, he was just a so and so. And it says so, so Boaz spoke to Mr. So and so. And he said, hey, I, I don't know if you've heard, but Naomi's come back, and her daughter-in-law, their husband's died, they're back. She wants to sell her property, part of her property, be able to survive and live. And you're the first in line as a family member, a kinsman redeemer who can buy things back, to buy it. And so I'm next in line, but you're first, and so just want you to know. And if you don't want it, I do, but if you want it, that's cool. And the guy goes, man, I get all that limit. I'll take it. And we go, oh, love story is not going to work out. Come on, everything's love story. And they're going to the airport and they got to jump in a taxi. You see those? You don't see any love. So, anyway, so, so this is like those taxi scenes. It's not going to happen. But Boaz is a, he's a smart dude. And then he says, but, let <laughs> me you know, wait for that. But, but if you marry, if, if, you, if you take the land, you got to marry Ruth the Moabitess. And you got to take on the mother-in-law. And whatever children you have belong to Mahon, Mahon her, her first husband. It's all in his name. And in fact, all the land, when you die, they, it stays in their, their family. And the guy goes, oh, no, that, this is not going to work. My wife will not like this. And my family will not like this. I pass. <laughs> Boaz was, he was good. Boaz said, I'll take it. And I'll take her. And I don't care if I give up name, property, land. There's somebody else who bought us who gave it all up so you and I could have it all. There's another kinsman redeemer. That, that's the story. So Boaz makes a choice. He makes a choice to choose her. He acted. So Boaz and Ruth choose to get relationally healthy pay relational attention, take relational action. Last one, fourth choice. Prioritize spiritual 
compatibility. God was at the center of Ruth and Boaz's hearts and relationship. A lot is said about compatibility. Let me just tell you, there, there are many areas of compatibility that are helpful. Okay? It's helpful if you share some, if you're both mourning people. Like, in fact, I honestly believe God kind of has fun with this, just my opinion. You ever seen a morning person marry a night person? Or a shopper marry a saver? <laughs> or, a, or a person who, who, who never stops marry somebody who never starts? Ever seen those? I think God does that and just says, watch this. Like, I, I, do, I, do, I do. I just think, it, I think it's entertainment for heaven. And, and it helps us because they can, they, can, they, they can help us. So, so there are many areas of compatibility that I believe are helpful, but they are not essential. This one's essential. Biblically speaking, there is one essential compatibility you must have for the love of your life, for the friend of your life, and it's spiritual compatibility. Here's how the Apostle Paul puts it, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Don't become partners with those who reject God. How can you make a partnership out of right and wrong? It's not partnership that's, say it, it's not partnership, it's war. I don't have the time. If we had the time and we were in a smaller setting, there are people in this room, in this house, in this family of faith who could tell you about violating this directive of God not to partner with somebody you're not a spiritual compatibility partner with. And the cost and the price and the war it is not that Christian couples don't have issues and struggles. They do. Jewel and I do. I am most of them, but we do. <laughs> and if you tell her and don't tell her the whole story, how we got married, I will have more problems. So you, you tell the truth. She'll be in the next service. Jewel and I have issues. There are no two married couples. We become one. We aren't one. But we have a source of strength and wisdom to face every issue, crisis, struggle. We have a heaven-sent helper who is in us, who is with us, who gives us wisdom and guidance and power to do what we cannot do on our own so that we can grow through every challenge, every failure, every bad choice, every good choice. That's the whole... I don't know how you stay married without the Holy Spirit. I don't know how you succeed. We don't. Now, some of you are like, you can push back on me. I got other stuff I want to say, but I don't have time to say it. And, and sometimes when I say these things, it's, it's how I make more parking places for newer people because people, I'm not coming back. <laughs> so I create parking spaces. It is so important to understand once again because I hear singles, come on, Jeff. If I only date, if I only marry a believer, I'm limiting my options. No, no, you're not limiting your odds, you're improving your odds of succeeding. Amen. You are. You're not limiting yourself, your, your odds of, in fact, l l let me show you. Here's a stat from a national survey on marriage and divorce. National survey, this is over thousands of couples in, in the United States. One out of every two and a half marriages in the United States ends in divorce. But when a couple commits their lives to Christ, when they're, when, when, when they're com spiritually compatible, put Jesus at the center, they don't just believe, they behave. They attend church together, they pray with, they pray for each other. Listen, to, listen. the divorce rate drops for Christian couples who are not Christian in name, they're Christian in action, from one out of every two and a half marriages to one out of every 1,105 marriages. That's the stats. One for two and a half or one for 1,105? Which odd do you like? That's why. Now, some of you go, great, Jeff, too late. 
I've already married an unbeliever. Then scripture tells us again with that, we, we don't leave them, we don't abandon them. We pray for them. We live our life in front of them by our attitudes and actions. We show them what faith in God can do. But how we act toward them, not out of what they do to us, because what God has done for us. And then the Holy Spirit uses our attitudes and actions to create spiritual thirst in them, never give up on them. We pray for them. Now, if you are single and you're dating somebody and they're not a believer, they're the wrong person. How can you say it? Because God says it. He's got a better person for you because the best person for you. Now, can they come to Christ? Yeah, but listen, when I was growing up, we called it missionary dating. They're not a believer, but I'll lead them to Jesus. Oh, no, no, no. Listen, there's a lot of people that, well, I'll go to church with you, and then, but, but, but then after you get married, they don't go to church. No, no. You pay attention over time. Do they have a real faith? God has a great love story for your life. To be greatly loved by him, to greatly love others like he loves us, and specifically to find and keep the love of your life, trust God that your love story is still being written, listen, by the same God who wrote Ruth's. And to quote a very famous philosopher, and that's all I got to say about that. (laughs) Would you just bow your head and heart with me just for a moment? God, I thank you for the stories that don't just entertain us, they equip us, they show us. They tutor us. They tutor us in the consequence of decisions. They show us what happens when choices are made to encourage us in the choices we make. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, just for a moment, online, wherever you are. God loves you more than you know, and God wants to love through you in greater ways than you've ever loved before. He has a love for your life. He has soul-enriching friendships for your life. How do we experience them? By the choices we make. And the first one is to be healthy, to be relationally healthy, and that starts with God. And if you've never asked God to be the leader and director of your life, I just encourage you to do that today. It's not a form prayer, a formula prayer, but right where you are, you can simply pray, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. You loved me before I even knew who you were. You loved me before you made me. You died on the cross to pay my sin bill. You rose again to show me there is life beyond death. And I accept you as the Savior. I accept you as the leader of my life. I want to be right with you, and I want to be right with everyone else because of you. In Jesus' name. I pray for marriages, I pray for singles, I pray for those who've been divorced, those who are widowed, I pray for those who don't plan to get married but they need great friends. And Holy Spirit, may this word be your word to us this day that we not only hear, we do. In Jesus' name.